forward and welcome everyone to class. Jema Siki Sapo. Thank you for uh, joining class. We'll uh, begin. Uh, we were looking at what were we looking studying on Friday? What did we study? The Lord's servant. Yes, Lucy. The Lord's servant through the verses Isaiah 42, 1, 6, and 7. Okay, we were looking at the servant songs, but what are we basically studying in this chapter? Who uh, Jesus Christ, who establishes who established the new covenant and uh, has a high priest who officiated the covenant by springing of his blood, and he's a testator to make the new covenant effective. And okay. He himself became the new covenant, uh, new covenant which is embodied within the um, uh, Messiah. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Uh, but why are we studying all of this? So, what is the topic? Uh, promise of his coming, the prophecies. Okay, promise of his coming, the prophecies regarding what? Uh, which has got fulfilled. Second coming. The prophecy is coming of his birth. Yes, his incarnation. Right? God becoming flesh, God becoming man. Where's Diksha? She's not well. Okay. Okay, so we'll uh, continue. We began looking at, um, we were looking at studying some of the prophecies. Okay, and uh, we looked at um, Isaiah chapter 42, verses um, 1, 6, and 7. And we said this is one of the servant songs. This is the ninth prophecy that we were looking regarding the prophecies concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we looked at... Um, three things that we um, important three facts about the servant what is the first important fact what we learned from isaiah 42 what is the first thing we learned about the servant he establishes the covenant he himself was given as a covenant okay to the people and what is the second What's the second thing about the servant? Testator. Okay, that is the part of the first one. He himself is the covenant, so he's also the testator. What's the second thing that we looked at? He was he like he, sorry. He, he was to open oh, blind eyes, it. bring prisoners out, and those who sit in darkness out of the prison house. Yes, thank you. So he's a servant who would open the blind eyes set the captives free, those in bondage, he will release them from bondage. And we see, we saw uh, the New Testament scripture passages, we talk about the fulfillment of this in Jesus Christ. Okay. And then we also studied about Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, about Naphtali and Zebulun. And uh, we looked at how the promise was fulfilled by Jesus um, through these tribes, Naphtali and Zebulun. Okay. And what is the third important fact about the servant? He'll be a light to the Gentiles. He'll bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Okay. Which means we're saying that Jesus' ministry was not just to the Jews. It was not just for the Jewish people, but his ministry was also to the Gentiles. Now, why are we... Uh, <coughs> Sorry, why is this being uh, elaborated or mentioned in scripture? That Jesus' ministry is not just for the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Why is it mentioned? Why is emphasis given? Salvation is for all, yes. Jews thought the Messiah was only for, for them. Right? They thought they are the people with the laws, the covenants, the prophets, the 
um, the Messiah is going to come from them. They are the chosen race, the chosen people. They have all the covenants, the laws, the prophets, the forefathers. So everything they've thought they are like the privilege, the high caste of society, so to say. Okay. But and they uh, look down upon the Gentiles. But salvation is for Jews and Gentiles. There's no Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. Amen. So that is what um, the Messiah would come. And his, his ministry was not just for the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. He will also bring righteousness and justice to them as well. Okay. So this whole task of bringing justice and righteousness to Gentiles, was it fully completed in Jesus, fulfilled the ministry? The ministry to the Gentiles is fully completed, to the Jews and Gentiles is fully completed by Jesus? Ongoing, sister. Yes, it's ongoing, Sister Lucy. Thank you. Because it is not finished. It was uh, the, the the task was completed in terms of the the sacrifice was made. But God looks to us. We as the body of Christ, we as the church, we are here to bring forth to, uh, justice to the Gentiles and be a light to the Gentiles. So Christ is fulfilling His task in and through us, His body, which is the church okay and we see this even in the early church we see that in the apostles um, in the early church they also did their ministry to the gentiles and we look at paul uh, mentioning this in various places uh, acts chapter 13 verses 46 to 48 is one of the places where paul and barnabas you know they say that uh, you people had the word of god but you rejected it Okay, and so now we turn to the Gentiles. Okay, and God has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, and you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And so, what happens when the Gentiles heard this? Verse 48. What happened to the Gentiles? Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 48. What happens to them when they heard? Yes, they were very happy and they glorified God. Why? Because they were also included in the plan of salvation. They're also part of the eternal life and many of them believed. Okay. So that was um, the last bit of the uh, portion that we had left incomplete in the last class when we were looking at um, the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 46, 42 verses 1, 6 and 7. So any questions regarding the prophecies uh, concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ? There are many more, but we looked at some important ones. Any questions, any queries, anything that you don't un did not understand, you want me to explain before we move on to the next chapter, chapter 5? No questions? No clarifications, anything you want me to explain again? Okay. We'll move on to chapter 5, where we'll try to understand the incarnation. What is incarnation? What is incarnation? God? Taking on human God. form. Taking on human form, God becoming human, God becoming flesh. Okay. So um, we will look at our focus will be not on the historical aspect in terms of how Jesus lived, where he went, what he did, and all of those things, but rather on the spiritual implications. Okay. What are the spiritual truths implications that we will uh, gain? So we look at. Um, uh, we'll, we'll gain a few insights of the how of incarnation, how God became human, okay? How did humanity and divinity exist in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ? How was he fully God? How was he fully man at the same time? How was he 100% God? How was he 100% man at the same time, okay? So we'll look and gain a biblical perspective of his incarnation 
okay and we'll also look at what happened when the eternal god how when deity became human or deity became took on humanity okay again we look at the spiritual implications of this and not the historical aspect how he walked on the earth how we lived what he did okay so we'll begin by looking at um, the biblical perspective of his incarnation uh, again we will look at one, john chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 but i'm not going to focus on that because we studied that quite a bit in chapter 1 and chapter 2 we look at verse 14 so can somebody please read john chapter 1 verse 14 please and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth yes so we see that the word became flesh the word became god you know uh, sorry the word was god the word was with god in the beginning and god became man okay the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth okay so why do you think jesus became or took on hum, humanity why did divinity why did god become man or why did divinity become humanity why did god become man why did he take on the human nature why Okay, showing, setting us an example, being a model, okay, that uh, we can overcome temptation, we can live the life, follow the laws that he's given us because people was, in the Old Testament were struggling to keep the laws, okay? We couldn't match up to the law. Uh -huh. We couldn't live according to the law. Okay. So he came to fulfill the law, keep the law, and show us as an example, okay? Why did the word become flesh? Why did divinity become humanity, take on humanity? Why? Sanjay says to show us the way, the truth, and the life, okay? Deepu says to save mankind. Yes, one of the reasons why uh, God became man so, was so that he can make the full sufficient perfect sacrifice only a sinless person can make the full sufficient and perfect sacrifice that will appease god okay uh, lucy says for our salvation what else other than salvation to manifest who god is to show us what who god is okay what's the meaning of manifest showing Showing who he is, showing his works. Manifest means getting into reality. The word of God manifested himself means, you know, and in Jesus we could see the father means in a very real way, in a very tangible way. The way that we can touch, experience, feel. Okay. So it was Jesus who became man god becoming man so that we can understand the godhead we can understand the father he came to manifest who the father was he came to manifest the nature of the father okay the attributes and the characteristics of the father and so the word became flesh um when we talk about word becoming flesh you know uh, what do we mean what do we mean by flesh? Human. The word became being human. Being human, okay. Okay, becoming human, being human, okay. Uh, here an in-person student says, in a, in a tangible way, where we can experience, we can relate to in a real way, yes. The word became flesh means what? It's not just becoming human, but it's taking on the fullness of humanity. 
Okay, so even though Jesus was fully God, he was 100% God, but yet he took on the fullness of humanity. So when he say he took on the fullness of humanity means what? He was 100% human. He went through the struggles and the challenges that we face as humans, right? Was he tired? Was he hungry? Was he felt lonely, deserted? Uh, did he hurt in his body? Yes. He, did he sleep? Yes. So, you know, we see that he took on the fullness of humanity. He went through everything in the natural process of a human being. Why? Why did he have to do that? Why did he have to do that? Why did he become so fully human? Why did the eternal Logos took on, take on the fullness of humanity? No answers? Ah, uh, uh, tell me. You can use the mic. Okay, it's okay. It doesn't matter. There are many students. Okay, so here an in-person student, he was speaking in Hindi, so he didn't want to use the mic. He says, God had given Adam and Eve authority in the Garden of Eden. And when they sinned, they lost that authority. And Jesus came to take back that authority from Satan. And also to set us an example to show us how we can flow in that authority. But, you know, uh, in the boundaries that God has given us, how we can still use that authority and how we can glorify God, how we can extend his kingdom. Yes. Uh, Sanjay says to identify with us in our pains and our struggles. Yes. To identify in our pains and struggles. That's why the writer of Hebrews says we have a high priest who identifies with us, who, was, who went through temptation just like we go through, but yet did not sin. So what is he saying? Hey, Jesus was fully human like you and me. He went through temptations, but he did not yield to temptations, which means it means that when you face temptation, that you can also not yield to temptation. Okay. Um, Lucy says to set us an example and a model. Yes. Okay. So he took on the fullness of humanity so he can identify with us. Okay. He can identify with our struggles, with our challenges. Okay, he can identify with what we are going through and also we can identify with him. Okay, and we can become his representatives here on earth. When he created Adam and Eve, how did he create Adam and Eve? In his image, right? Exactly like him. Why did God create Adam and Eve in his image? Because he wanted them to represent him here on earth okay he wanted to be he wanted us to be the people who would manifest his glory here on earth okay so that is why he became he came the fullness of humanity so he can understand us and he can also set us an example okay so here it says that you know the word became flesh and dwelt among us what is the meaning of dwelt lived amongst us so dwelt basically mean means uh, you know dwelling in tents okay dwelling in tents the, in the old testament we see most of the time uh, when people journeyed they dwelt in tents and also here uh, dwelt literally means tabernacled dwelling you know that tabernacle in hindi, hindi they say tambu you know wherever they journeyed the tabernacle journeyed along with them. The tent of meeting also journeyed among uh, with them. And it's at the, in the tabernacle that God manifested his glory. You know, God would come there. His presence would be seen there. He would speak. He would make known his ways and what the people need to 
do. So God manifested his glory in that tent. Okay, so that is why here we read the writer of John is saying, hey, he's writing to the Jews. So the Jews know that, you know, in the Old Testament, God dwelt with man. His presence was there in the tabernacle. So he's saying this word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us, and we beheld his glory. Okay, so what was the glory that the people in the Old Testament saw when when God manifested himself in the tabernacle, what glory did they see? Whose glory did they see? God's glory, right? When Jesus dwelt among men, what glory did they see? Sonship glory. Thank you, Nelson. Why didn't we see God's glory when Jesus dwelt here on earth? How do we know it's sonship glory? Because Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 says, Father, I finished my work. You know, just before the night, he, the garden of Gethsemane was going to be betrayed. You know, he says, Father, finish my work. Now I'm coming back to you. Give me the glory I had before. You know, and, uh, and he says, now I'm giving my glory to my disciples. So the glory he was talking about that he's going to give us as those who believe in him is his sonship glory. And he's saying, now give me back the glory. When I come back, he's talking about the glory that he had as deity, as God. Okay. Now, when we're saying that Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, humanity and divinity coexist in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Why didn't Jesus manifest his God's the glory of God, why did he manifest sonship glory? When we say that word became flesh, hum divinity became becoming humanity, and in Jesus, deity and humanity existed in perfect unity, perfect oneness. Jesus was completely God, completely man, 100% God, 100% man. But why didn't he manifest his even though he was 100% God, why didn't he manifest his the glory of God? Why did he manifest the sonship glory when he lived here on this earth? In the Old Testament, they saw the glory of divinity, God being manifested. Why did Jesus not manifest his the glory of deity? Why did he manifest the sonship glory? Do you are able to understand my question? Yes, did you ever think about it? If you look at John chapter 17, it talks about, you know, um, the glory of Jesus and did not have his, he had the sonship glory. If you look at John chapter 17. So look at verse um, 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, and they may be just as we are. Where does he say, God, give me back the glory that I had? So, what is the answer to my question? Look at verse 4 and 5. I have glorified you. Look at verse 4 and 5. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And then in verse... Um, uh, you know, 22, he says, and the glory which you gave me, I've given them that they may be one just as we are one. So why did Jesus not manifest his, the glory of deity? Why did he manifest the sonship glory when he lived here on this earth? Because he had taken uh, the form of uh, uh, human. So, uh, uh, he had he had given up his uh, 
uh, the powers that God has, like you know, being uh, omnipresent and omniscient. So, and he always referred on, on on earth to the Father. He prayed to the Father, and that's what he he taught us to do as well. I think I don't know, I'm on the right track. Yeah, he he did not uh, choose to exercise his power of being omnipotent. His attributes of being sorry, not power attributes of being omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He refrained from using it, even though he was fully God. Yeah. Okay. So it's there in verse twenty-four. Uh, uh, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. So, so on that ground, it's like the glory that uh, the Son has received; He's given it to us. Yes, he, we receive the sonship glory. But my question is, why didn't He manifest His the glory of deity. Why did he manifest sonship glory? First Timothy, yes. Sorry? He limited himself or refrained himself from using it. Why? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says, you know. No one has seen, yes, Sanjay says, no one can see God with their physical eyes and live, right? Um, God lives in unapproachable light who no man has seen or can ever see. So if Jesus came and he wanted to reveal the heart of the Father to us, and if he wanted to be that sacrifice for sin, okay, and if he manifested his sonship glory, could we even walk along with him, touch him, experience him in a tangible way? Yes or no? If he manifested the, sun, the glory of God, could we walk along with him, experience him in a tangible, in a real way? No, we can't. Because it says here that he's, when he manifests the glory of God, you know, no eye can see him. He lives in unapproachable light. No man has seen or can ever see. We can't see. Right? We would still be like people in the Old Testament trying to understand God. And imagine if he manifested the, uh, the glory of deity, no one could crucify him on the cross. You can't lay your hands on, you know, on the, on the glory of God. Can't even come near it. It's like we can't even think of imagining going anywhere near the sun. We, we live on millions of kilometers away from the sun. Okay, so that is why Jesus refrained from using his, the glory of deity, but he took on the sonship glory so that we can experience him in a real tangible way and he can fulfill the will of the father. He can complete the work of the father for which he uh, came. So he refrained from using, like Warren also says, refrained from being omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, also refrain, we'll study about it in Philippians, also refrain from manifesting his, the deity of, uh, the glory of God, okay? So when we talk about the word dwelt among us, it basically means tabernacled, where, so when, when Jesus lived, we were able to see the glory of God, because we were able to see it with our naked eyes. We were able to experience it. We were able to experience his healing. We were able to experience his miracles in a very tangible, in a real way. He could touch the eyes of the blind man. Okay, He could raise the dead back to life. He could hold their hands. He could do all of those things. People could experience him. He could carry children. You know, He could speak to them. He could relate to them like a human, in a real way, because he was manifesting the sonship glory. But through his sonship glory, he was still manifesting the glory of God, which means, what do we mean by manifesting the glory of God? What do we mean when you say manifesting the glory of God? Is to put okay. into action. Put into action. When we talk about, we, we, we are called to manifest the glory of God or Jesus manifested the glory of God. It basically means manifesting who God is and what he does. Okay, please don't forget this. Two things. Manifesting the glory of God means who God is, his nature, his attributes, and what he does, the miracle signs, the things that he works out in our lives. So how is the glory of God manifested in our lives? 
through who God is. And that's the work of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is very evident in our lives. It basically uh, uh, manifests the nature of God. And what God does is manifest it through the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, And Jesus desires that we manifest His glory. Just like when He created Adam and Eve. And that's why He says in John chapter 17 verse 22, God, you know, Father, I'm giving them the glory which you have given me that they may be one just as we are one and that we can also manifest and continue his work here on earth. All of you with me? Yes, all of you able to understand what's going above your heads? Some of you are just looking at me very puzzled. What about the online students? All of you understanding? Yes, no? Okay. So we see that in the Old Testament, God lived and moved with his people. So wherever, wherever the people moved, you know, uh, they move from place to place. Uh, Daniel, can you please mute your mic? Daniel, can you please mute your mic, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. So we see that wherever the Israelites moved, the tent, the tabernacle also moved with uh, them. Okay, uh, and we see that God dwelling among His people, moving with His people, providing for His people, and He manifested His glory, manifested who He is and what He can do. He did, you know, got water from the rock. He provided manna. He, uh, you know, was. Um, gave them light during uh, the, the night time, you know, uh, shielded them from the, uh, the sun during the day. So we see they experienced God in a real way. So also in incarnation, we see God coming and dwelling with mankind, okay? God living with mankind and we beheld his glory. We could see the glory of God, which was manifested in Jesus. So the glory that Jesus manifested when he lived here on, his, on the earth is the sonship glory. Okay. Uh, that is what we read in John chapter 1 verse 14. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what was the glory that Jesus manifested uh, when he lived here on the earth? He manifested his sonship glory. Okay. Now, um, the Greek word for glory is doxa. Okay, it basically means honor, reputation, reputation, or esteeming a person. Okay, so um, so the word doxa in the New Testament, when you read glory, it means doxa in Greek, and it basically means honor, splendor, and majesty. So when, when Jesus came, he manifested the splendor, the power, the glory, the majesty of God. And when we manifest the glory of God, we're also doing the uh, same. Okay? And um, his glory was characterized by grace and truth. Okay? His glory was manifested by grace and truth. Okay? That's why we see that uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we see grace, compassion, and mercy that he uh, shows forth. So when, when we're trying to understand, hey, how can this, uh, you know, how can Jesus be fully God and yet be fully man? How can, be, how can he be 100% God and how can he be 100% man the same time? Okay. We can know this because, you know, Jesus, who being the eternal word or the, the eternal God, he submitted himself to certain limitations, okay? He, he, he limited himself to certain things. He submitted himself to certain limitations, which he did not want, he, or he refrained from using it so that he can fulfill the will of the Father, even as he's come here on the earth. And for us... It's not very easy to understand, right? We can't understand how can divinity and humanity exist in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ? How can he be fully God, fully man? We cannot completely understand. We completely cannot define it, okay? Um, uh, and we only can understand what is being revealed to us, okay? And we know that Jesus could reveal only what could be revealed in the limitations of his 
humanness, only what can be understood by us. So he refrained from using those this nature and attributes that would would refrain him from you know expressing himself to us or expressing who God the Father is to us or fulfilling the will of the Father. So he refrained from using that. We will study that in a, a little more, and you'll be able to um, understand. Okay, so. Um, the important thing we need to understand is that, you know, uh, uh, of course, we can't understand how Jesus was truly God, truly man, fully God, fully man. Okay. He did not become, but we need to understand that he did not become flesh in the sense of ceasing to be what he eternally was. That means when Jesus became human, he did not cease or he did not stop being God. That is something that you need to remember, okay? He did not, when he became flesh, he did not cease to be what he eternally was. Who, who was he eternally? He was eternally God. So he did not stop from being God. Rather, the eternal God took on the fullness of humanity, which means in his body, in his soul, in his spirit, he was fully human, and he was also fully God, but he limited himself to the manifestations of the divinity. Limited himself to the manifestation of the div divinity means he did not manifest the glory of God. He refrained from being omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. We'll study all of that more in detail and you will be able to understand. Okay. Now let us look at Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1, 2, 3. Can somebody read that please? Before we read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, anyone has any questions, any doubts? All of you are able to understand? Yes? No? Okay. Can we, someone please read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, please? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged out all purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. So here we see that God has spoken to us through his son okay so everything that the father wanted to reveal to us is revealed through the son the word incarnate is basically god himself speaking to man god himself speaking to us okay so we look at two uh, other facts about incarnation or regarding inf incarnation uh, in this passage that we read or this verses that we read First thing we look at is, is Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. The second thing, he's the express image of God's person. Okay. Uh, if you look at the first one, God, Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. If you look at this in the Amplified Bible, he says, it says, or the, he's the express image of his person. You know, if you look at the Amplified Bible, it says he's a perfect imprint and the very image of of God's nature. That means exactly how God is, his nature, where he looks, the perfect imprint is seen in Jesus. Okay. The Jerusalem Bible says he's the perfect copy of his nature. Okay. The New International Version says he's the exact representation of his being. Okay. And the literal Greek Bible says, who being radiance of the glory and the representation of the reality of him. Which means we're saying, hey, Jesus was fully man, but he was also fully God. Okay. And uh, we see in Jesus the perfect, the very image of God's nature. We see the perfect copy of his nature. We see the exact representation of his being. Okay, so let's uh, look at what it means that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Okay, uh, God's glory is basically manifesting who God is and what he does, his nature, his attributes, and his works. Okay, so all this is expressed in 
was expressed in Jesus. You know, when, when Jesus lived here on this earth, he, people were able to see and experience the nature of God and what God does. Okay. So it says here that Jesus is the brightness, which means, what does it mean? Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Which means the nature and the attributes, the character of God is seen outshining in Jesus. When you look at some people, they stand out compared to the rest of us, right? They outshine compared to the rest of us. So, you know, um, basically Jesus was, you know, the brightness of God's glory means he was outshining the nature and the character of God. So all who God is, was seen, was manifest was shown out through Jesus. What do we mean when we say that Jesus is the express image of God's person? It basically means he's a perfect copy. He's the exact representation. Or it's like in reality seeing God himself. Okay, who God really is was seen through the nature and the characteristic of Jesus. So the incarnation you know, of Jesus, we receive the complete revelation of the living God. It's not just seeing the nature, but also hearing what God wants to speak to us or reveal to us. The mysteries of the kingdom of God was revealed to us by Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is a complete manifestation of God. Or he's the complete revelation of the living God. So everything that we want to understand and know about who God is can be seen in the person and the image of Jesus Christ. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? Right. You know, uh, just imagine this God who lives in unapproachable light, who is so glorious, so magnificent, so great, so awesome, so powerful. Uh, would just want to limit himself to come and live amongst us to reveal who God is, to reveal the heart of God, to reveal the, the nature of God, to reveal the attributes of God. It just, it kind of blows our mind to just think, you know, you know, God can think of me a significant, insignificant person like me, a small speck in this huge world. That, you know, he thought about us, he thought about us weak humans, fallen humans, frail humans who do not want to obey him, who do not uh, want to continue loving him, who choose the things of this world. But yet he thinks so big of us, he thinks so great of us. And when he does things for us, he, the things that he does for us is so great, is, is so uh, um, you know, we stand in awe of it. It's, it, it just blows our mind to think that, you know, we are just so small. We're so we, we are weaklings, you know. And yet this great big God wants to come and manifest himself. Show us the nature. Show us the attributes. Show us the character of God. Isn't that amazing? That, you know, he limited himself. He refrained from using his, uh, his nature and attributes of being deity so that we can see, we can understand, we can experience him in such a real way so that we can have a real a relationship with him and this is what you know he comes to fulfill his whole plan and purpose to have communion to have fellowship to have relationship and all this jesus did or god did for us is because he wants to have a relationship with you and me he wants to communicate with us he wants us to experience him and not only that you know he it also says in ephesians that he's the fullness of the deity has been given to each one of us you know, the fullness of Godhead is being given to each one of us. That means he wants us to experience him in the fullest sense. So you know, don't uh, restrict yourself from experiencing who God is in the fullest sense because he wants to reveal all of him to us. So be uh, greedy, be hungry, be desirous for more of him. Say, God, I want to experience more of you, who you are, your nature, your love. Your power, God, I want to just experience that. Even when you are reading the New Testament, you can read familiar passages of scripture, but you know, look at it with a different perspective from now, saying, hey, here is this God, you know, uh, who laid aside his, uh, refrained from using his glory of deity, took on the sonship glory so that I can know him. So say, God, even as I'm reading this familiar script passage, 
you know, in the Gospels, have read it thousands of times or hundreds of times, have listened to it, but you came to manifest yourself. You came to manifest your nature and reveal your mysteries to us. So reveal your truths to me, even as I'm reading the scripture. And, you know, when we do that, he's going to really breathe on his word and his word is going to come so alive. And so we can just experience his manifest presence in such a powerful and such a real way. Can we do that? At least for all that he's done, looking at his word and just experiencing him and desiring him more in the way that he's come to reveal him himself uh, to us okay so we see that uh, in colossians uh, 1 chapter chapter 1 verse 15 it says jesus is the image of the invisible god okay isn't it wonderful that we can't see god but yet so wonderful to know that same god has come to reveal himself to uh, us and second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says that uh, you know uh, christ who is the image of God, which means he's the he's not the avatar of God. He's not somebody who just taking on of a form of something, you know. Like when we act in uh, skits and all, you know, you can act like king, you can act like a beggar, you can act like Jesus. You can you don't become Jesus, right? You just act. You can act like a Samaritan woman, but you don't become the Samaritan woman. So we. But when Jesus, and it says here, he, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, it does not mean that he took on, you know, uh, an avatar. It means he's the exact representation. He's the exact revelation. Okay, so in the incarnation, the invisible God becomes visible. Okay. Any questions so far? Any questions? Uh, we'll study Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, and you'll understand, you know, uh, incarnation in a much more deeper way. Any questions? Just one more minute. Are you able to understand? Yes? Can you see the bigger picture of the incarnation than just Jesus coming down to die for your sins? and uh, receive all of that and live out that and experience him in the fullest sense okay there are no questions we'll end class we'll uh, yes can you please take the mic nelson so that others can listen to your question in john chapter 1 verse 14 the word is used as begotten so actually i want to know about more actually uh, begotten means yes it's a good question so um, the word begotten basically means that, you know, one of a kind, okay? Jesus is a one of a kind. Uh, it's from the, uh, the Greek word. Um, forget what the Greek word is, but uh, it just basically means it's, it's one of a kind. So when he says that he's the only begotten son of God, he means his, his origins is from God. He's the only one who was... From the father okay uh, he, we, he does not say here that he's only begotten of mary and joseph that means we can say he's the only son of mary and joseph he was not begotten of humanity because but he was begotten of god he is only one of the kind which means begotten means one of the kind so he has his origins from heaven not from humanity he was not born to earthly human parents he was conceived by the power of the holy spirit but he was not begotten of Mary and Joseph. He was begotten of uh, God, which means he's, he's God's son. He's, his origins are from there. Did that help? Okay. I'll explain that when I'm um, looking at the son, but it just basically means that. Yeah, good question. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, there are no questions. We'll end class. Okay. Um, thank you all for joining class. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Warren.